So, uh, yes, we are being recorded. I wanted to just thank uh, Professor Roberts for the invitation to share my work. Uh, Professor Ben, who's apparently just about to uh, have a baby for sponsoring the talk. Um, and everyone involved in the background who I probably don't know who they are. So, um, but thank you. And uh, Mikay san for all the help to get the word out and ensure we run smoothly this afternoon. I really appreciate uh, all that work in the background. <clears throat> uh, we've all been doing an inordinate amount of Zooming and I'm really thrilled to be with you today. Um, I was a bit astounded when I found out that 50 people had um, signed up for this initially, especially as so many people are Zoomed out right now. Uh, I do wish we were all in person, of course, and hopefully at some point we can meet soon. If you're ever in Bangkok, please do reach out to me. Um, that being said, I'm going to apologize in advance. There'll be parts of this presentation that I will need to read out to you, and <clears throat> especially with, with quotations where my eyes are on the paper or on the screen. It's not ideal on a Zoom, um, but thankfully we're in a room of fellow academics, so you know the deal. Um, that being said, I do have a presentation of visuals somewhat related to my paper uh, to help keep Zoom fatigue at bay. It's more like visual candy, but it is related and I did work on it. So um, let's jump right in. Can I ask for the screen to be pulled up, please? Thank you so much. And I'm just gonna... Great, oops. Thank you. Great, and I think I've got control of your that screen now. Let me have a look at the city. Perfect. Yeah, great. <clears throat> Can you try one more time with the remote control? Sure. Oh, no. Yeah, maybe you can try requesting again. I will give you the permission to. Okay, thank the you. Control. No, oh, it's not going through now. That's funny, we just did it. Okay, it seems like I've got it now. Hold on. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Although we're way somewhere else. Okay, Sam, I think what I'm going to do is just do it the old fashioned way. You start at the beginning and you click me through. Is that okay? Because otherwise, I, it's, it's too, it's lagging and it's going through my whole presentation. Okay, there's some of us who are on the Zoom who remember the good old days where you had a speaker on the screen and the computer that's like very far away from the speaker and he'd be going, next screen, please. So we're going to try that. Um, let's jump right in. I'm going to start at the end, so to speak, just to give you a roadmap of where we are heading first. Um, so yeah, click on that screen. Let's see what happens. Should, it should be number one, if you started right at the beginning. Zoom all the way back to one. Yes, perfect. This is a story about expanding our understandings of migration based on long-term research that centralizes the Asian perspective and attempts to see migration from the perspective of migrant families and the erstwhile sending society. This is also a story sharing a set of questions that's taken me some time to develop and which I'm currently thinking through. If you're looking for answers, I'm afraid you'll find only questions driven by thinking about the frame around which we think about migration research, especially questioning our imaginaries of structure, agencies, and belonging. Now we're gonna jump into the middle taking you to the middle of my first round of field work. Next slide, please. It is gentrifying Canary Wharf and the Docklands just opened. John Major has taken over as a leader of the Conservative Party who's been ruling over, who have been ruling over Britain since 1979 under the helm of Iron Lady Baroness Thatcher. At the time of my story, the current Chancellor of the 
uh, at the time of my current story, the, the right now current chancellor of the Exchequer, Rishi Sunak, was a teenager, mm -hmm. child of migrants to Britain, whose family moved to Britain in the 1960s from East Africa, and whose grandparents were born in Punjab, British India. Although related to my story, he's fast forward in social time. He's the next generation. Our focus right now is on the parents, not unlike his who migrated to London and their kids who are about 20 years plus and have already started university in the mid uh, 90s. We're in a local corner shop, milk, bread, butter, after school sweets and cigarettes or fags as they were more commonly called then. These sales and the daily task of keeping a store open and running keep Mr. Sharma busy all day. He agreed to meet for an interview. He worked 10 to 12 hours a day, so we had no choice but to do it in his shop. The interview was semi-structured. In this format, an anthropologist allows the interviewee to take the lead on the lack of a formal structure. It's more attuned to a conversation, provides a process of discovery and understanding, and is led by the participant. In response to one of his reflections, I asked, Uncle, how do you answer that question? Where are you from? And it's an obsession with our people to ask, where are you from? Or what side do you come from? How do you answer that? His reply was enigmatic. Next slide, please. Slide <clears throat> not going forward. I don't have control anymore. So um, next slide, please. So I am from nowhere because connections are just like footsteps. You move your foot and erasing the previous mark, the step is gone. This was our second interview. The first time I interviewed Mr. Sharma, I asked him where he had moved from. He replied, Delhi, paused for a while, and then stated, I must tell you though, I am from nowhere. Our family was first in Punjab, then we went to Bihar, then we came here. We were in West Pakistan in Rawalpindi. He continued, then we were in East Ham. Now we are in Leighton. So how many places do you wanna remember? For what? For just the knowing sake, isn't it? Mr. Sharma's words have stayed with me all these years, informed by his spontaneous reflections to an anthropologist loitering with intent. <clears throat> In his shop over a few sessions and with others during that initial fieldwork with Hindu Punjabis in London, like shopkeeper Mr. Sharma, they have complicated ways of referring to and invoking home at the temple, at dinner parties. In many different venues, Indian migrants to Britain would ask each other, where are you from? In doing so, they would reinscribe a connection of identity to place, differentiate the umbrella Asian or British Asian ascription into identities and categories that were more meaningful for them, that were usually based on language or culture groups, such as Punjabi, Bengali, Gujarati. They also made me aware that they experienced the query as an interrogation of belonging. And they in fact contributed to the title of my book. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Where are you from? Middle-class migrants in the modern world. Over the course of my research in London, I met many different Hindu Punjabis, almost 200 people. I worked most closely with four families, the Kapoors, the Chablas, the Agarwals, the Kalyas, and four key informants, Mr. Ram Sharma, Mr. Prem Basin, Karnal Bandari, and Ms. Rani Sanan. These were post-World War II migrants to Britain, urban-urban migrants, often Delhi to London, but some of the families may have also been in East Africa. <clears throat> from professional middle to lower middle class families before migration, 
and they established themselves as middle-class professionals in England. In terms of their caste status, they were Khatri, Banya, or Brahmin. At the time of my initial field work, the parents were nearing retirement, their children were in college or establishing themselves as professionals, usually on their way to being medical doctors, lawyers, accountants, or engineers. Now the parents are retired <clears throat> and the children who I'd interviewed are all married, and in one case, actually divorced. They have families of their own. And so it's been some time and I'm still in touch with one of those families, um, I would say pretty regularly. And when we go to London, we meet with them. Although initially when I started my field work, I was deliberately looking for Hindu Punjabis I was looking for them because they were an understudied group in the general research that had happened on Asians in Britain. What was unexpected was that most of the families, I would say the majority of the families I worked with were actually from partition families. This is the folks who in 1947 moved, relocated, forced moved involuntary migration from Pakistan into India and the majority of their families had settled in refugee colonies in India, mostly in the Punjab or Delhi. The displacement of their families <coughs> during partition had altered their sense of their homeland. For some, like Mr. Sharma, so much so that he can claim to be from nowhere. But as you all know, it's not so easy to dismiss oneself as being from nowhere. The initial research I did had a major, major presumption that I was also unknowingly pushing against. It's shared by most, if not all, migration research of that time, possibly even now. It's a view that's so pervasive and fundamental that it's not really <coughs> fully explored or articulated out loud. <coughs> Excuse me, the assumption is this, that migration is a singular moment. As a result, the research emphasizes a singular move. In the case of my work, a migrant departs from India and moves to Britain. The singular moment and movement focus results on in, in an informative but partial view. It took me longer to realize that the story or rather the dominance of that plot line in migration stories in the majority of social science research actually related to things like funding structures, national anxieties over immigration, and ways of thinking about migration that or originated during colonialism and imperialism, especially the rural urban migration of colonial Africa. Thankfully in my discipline, my, thankfully, my discipline insists that we listen deeply and let our informant's words guide us. I slowly began to unravel the threads and move beyond this singular understanding. I hadn't started my research looking for stories of partition refugees. I began with an interest in covering different aspects of migration, cultural change, sense of ethnic identity over time for middle-class families, and the ways they saw themselves as Punjabi, Hindu, British, Indian, Black. However, as a result of my focus on Hindu Punjabis, I found a lot of families that had come from partition in a previous generation. And I began to develop a nascent idea that the immigrant mobility that I was witnessing of economic voluntary migrants was not a singular event, but part of a larger trajectory linked to a longer family migration history. So, Heads up that I'm about to drop you in a totally different part of my field work right now. Um, and again, next slide, please. <clears throat> Great, we're now in central Delhi, thank you. In the first refugee colony established in 1948 by Prime Minister Nehru. Like most postdocs let loose into the world, I was there to follow up on a hunch that had grown out of my PhD, to better understand partition stories from those who experienced the event, and especially the connection with families. I remain so grateful to the Center of South Asian Studies at Cambridge for the support that I received as a Smuts Fellow. Next slide, please. It is 1997. 
<clears throat> one month after the British Empire officially ended <clears throat> Hong Kong police and governor general politician, Chris Patton is being returned to the UK in grand style, thanks to Queen Elizabeth's son, Prince of Wales central role at the handover ceremony with end, which ended with both of them sailing away on Royal Yacht Britannia, which once ruled a quarter of the globe. It's 50 years after India had ended its relationship with Britain through independence, the Quit India Movement and Partition. It's three years after Prime Minister Manmohan Singh liberalized the Indian economy and the effects were trickling down in some respects and cascading in other measures. And a few months since I.K. Gidral, himself born in current day Jailum, Pakistan, a freedom fighter who'd been jailed had actually taken over as prime minister. And in 1947, his family had joined between 12 to 17 million people estimated to have crossed the newly formed border. Now recall this, there were no passports, there were few identity papers, nothing really formalizing the border that you can see in the top right of your screen right now. And these are from sort of declassified documents that have uh, come out that I access through the British Library archives. Next slide, please. <clears throat> uh, we are in Rajinder a residential colony in the middle of bustling Delhi, where the middle class is rising and the demographics are shifting the Indian economy to its youth. These are the images that you see in front of them of the actual movement of people during that time. Most of the uh, most of the footage, the, the photos that, that we have are from a time photographer, a female time fo photographer, who was one of the few who actually captured what was happening on a large scale and went out into the field. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Rajinder Nagar was established by Nehru as the first refugee settlement area in 1948. This settlement made temporary move permanent. I worked on collecting oral history narratives from three generations of Hindu families on their reflections and connections to partition. Those who had been displaced by the event and those who were young children or not yet born at the time of partition and their children, namely young adults who had been born, schooled and grown up in India. My initial work in Delhi was framed by key questions around movement of people. How do we understand these displacements, the impact on families, and the, and the ways that the memory of displacement comes through the generation? <clears throat> Almost 100% of the families in my fieldwork area, and I kind of tried to mark it in green and yellow on the Google map. And this is a modern map, but this is sort of the area that I was covering. <clears throat> um, Almost 100% of the families who worked in that, who lived in that, that area at the time of my research were still partitioned refugees. There were starting to be a few economic migrants from the south of India, um, but majority of people here were still uh, like in that allotment space. Many had at least one family member who'd become Videshi or an overseas Desi in the UK, the Canada or the US. My fieldwork involved a lot of chai and samosas. And initially, most of the men were very reluctant to share anything. And they gave me very sanitized official versions of history. This lasted for the first two or three brief meetings. Eventually, as everyone became more comfortable with me hanging around, they saw me walking the lanes that I'm showing you a picture of here. And I was vouched for and introduced through their social networks they finally began to open up. From that field work, I was based in the refugee colony for six months, and then I was in and out of Delhi for three years. I want to share small glimpses of what I heard at that time. We're drinking tea now with glucose biscuits in a living room in one of the refugee houses. The walls that were temporary had become solid. The lane was busier with motorized scooters and cars and we're sitting with a gentleman in his 90s. He served as a water engineer with the government of British India, and then 
after independence in the Indian civil service. He was 42 at the time of partition, married with children. He had just returned to Delhi a couple nights before after an extended visit with his son in Detroit. He began to ask me questions. How would this research be used? Who would have access? These were all very good questions that had already been cleared by an ethics review board. Then he asked me something. Would Tony Bear read your research? I was startled by that one, and he was serious and sincere. Partially his concern was for what would happen to his information. <clears throat> then he shared with me, I've never told anyone this before. I clarified that I was writing a book and this would end up in libraries and that people would read it, but that I would change the identifying details. The fact that 50 years after the event, he was still worried about colonial surveillance, consequences to being a witness, is a telling aspect to people's lived experience of the imperial order and how fear and terror characterize the run up to India's independence. After a few more queries, which I answered patiently, he finally opened up, kind of. He shared the official narrative. <laughs> By this time in the research, this was a familiar turn. When asked about partition, I got almost an identical narration of official events as they unfolded. Dates, who did what, when. Nehru, Gandhi, Jinnah, Mountbatten. Not surprising as newspaper reading and the BBC radio news service was so ubiquitous at the time of independence that the public sphere had really produced a singular narrative that had become the refugee narrative. Many who had lived at that time were reluctant to share their personal histories and their grandchildren only heard official or disjointed accounts. Another elderly gentleman actually raised his voice a bit when I tried to gently probe on the personal story after he had given me the official account. Why do you wanna talk about partition? Everyone knows what happened. What happened? The British came, we had to leave, we are here. There is no use talking about the past. It's done. Often, if there were groups of elderly men or women, like in a local park or after a satsang at the Arya Samaj or at a haven, then they would be more willing to share. The same man at a later time told me more about his life before partition and the difficulties they faced and how actively they worked to forget partition telling the official's history allowed them to erase the pains of the personal one. If you're curious to know more about those stories, um, I've requested that a link be shared in the chat afterwards so you can read about them. But I wanna now say that, you know, their accounts are not unlike ours. As researchers, when we think about partition or any event in history, we think of a singular date. Can I ask for the next slide, please? <clears throat> the official historical date uh, for petition is August 15, 1947. Yeah, sorry, next slide as well, thank you. That's the day that the leaders of the, polit of the political leaders in India and Britain informed that India would gain independence by 1948 and that it would be positioned, partitioned in two nations, India and Pakistan. Within a few days of the announcement, the date of independence was brought forward to the 14th, 15th of August. So basically what happens in June, you get the announcement and a few days later they say, um, you get the announcement that the partition would happen in 1948 and then a few days later, there's an announcement that actually the date's been moved up to the 14th or 15th of August. Um, <clears throat> so they really had six weeks. A boundary commission <coughs> was set up to establish new national border. The new border was clearly defined on paper only. The actual border that divided the nation states, in fact, took up over two decades to take shape. <clears throat> 
In the case of my work in London, Delhi, and interviews over the years with partition refugees and their extended families in the US, in Bangkok, and interviews actually with Arab families in Dubai and Kuwait, who had left India after two or three generations for the Gulf, because the countries were refashioning themselves as post-colonial sovereign states with new rules of belonging. So with that came new constitutions and new acts of citizenship and people who had been there for many years decided to leave. I've heard these complicated histories of all these migrations, all linked somehow to that singular date as a lived experience, how it involved and affected families. And I began to reflect on a larger pictures of the complexities of migration as a longer term process. Taking the view alongside other more recent scholarly works that partition process is more apt a way to think about it than a singular event. And yet Indian citizenship as enshrined in the 1950s constitution was conceived very broadly. It extended to those born outside of India depending on proof that parents or grandparents were born in India, because it had to take into account the indentured who'd been sent all over during colonial times. India itself was defined based on the India Act of 1935. So it wasn't even the boundary of 1947 that they used to create citizenship. They used the Act of 1935, the boundaries of 1935. Most importantly, quote, in many, ways determining citizenship at the commencement of the Republic became a question of territorial location and claims of belonging to the territory." End quote. Other possibilities include kinship and religion, which did not gain traction at the time. With the passing of the Constitution, Indian national identity became coterminous with the physical borders of the Indian territorial state simultaneously concerned with temporal periods when the state could identify belonging based on the nation. The concern with time and space informed the careful constitutional considerations of Indian citizenship, and that became formally defined through a Citizenship Act of 1955. <clears throat> Looking at the historical record of legislative debates, publications from key figures, the links between citizenship, national belonging, and territory were not imagined in Benedict Anderson's sense, but actively represented and contested. In a new post-colonial state, actively creating the nation through creating the constitution. Roy <laughs> identifies a period of indeterminate citizenship. She argues that, and I'm sorry, this is a terribly long quote, quote Close examination of citizenship in this period shows both contested and anxiety over the determination of the national space, whereby the territorial as well as the cultural and legal domain of citizenship was marked and affirmed. The demarcation of citizenship at the commencement of the Republic seems to have been correspondingly, respondingly largely to the context of partition. Thus, even as it talks about citizenship accruing to Indians on account of birth and domicile, articles five to seven of the constitution concern themselves largely with the modalities of deciding the complicated question of citizenship of people migrated between India and Pakistan between 1st March, 1947. Now, I'm just gonna pause reading this to you, remember, the border is not even decided until a number of months later. And 26 January, 1950, when the constitution came into force. So it's a pretty large, almost three year window. <clears throat> um, significantly, the migrant referred to by the constitution while laying down the frameworks of citizenship in the new Republic was crucial to the affirmation of the sovereign identity of the nation. And that's from uh, sifting, selecting, relocating citizenship at the commencement of the Republic, Anupama Roy, a paper that she had done that's quite uh, useful and brilliant for me to think through this work. So what I'm trying to do is <coughs> with, with those facts and figures around Indian citizenship is to unpack that singular moments 
way of speaking about migration to, let's say, England, where we think about it as migrant from India who has moved to Britain. That's how they're ascribed and understood in the British sense, because they're um, that's where they came from and that's the passport they held. But to actually unpack it and show of the complicating history for how even those passports came to be. But unfortunately, most migration studies are often dominated by a rationalist perspective that at worst erases all these complexities and at best makes primary the frame of the so-called receiving society. So now let's go down um, a little rabbit hole. Research on migrant mobilities addresses the ways migration impacts the receiving nation state, often with an ex implicit or express focus on the problem of the immigrant. And work that aims to capture the migrant voice concerns with various questions of integration into new societies become primary. These are often dominated with focus on issues of cultural loss, sociocultural impacts of migration on language or heritage, connections to homeland, ways of assimilating, et cetera, et cetera. The frame in these approaches remains the same, highlighting some aspect of a fundamental question of belonging and the notion of a normative nation in the nation state. The plot line runs thus, a migrant moves, the nation state accepts or rejects the migrant. The migrant and the states are in a tangle of unease because belonging has been disrupted. This is where we get the terms voluntary migration, involuntary migration, economic migrants, refugees, forced migrants. What I've come to realize is how the so-called voluntary brain drain economic migration in one generation actually intersects with the displacement forced migration in a previous generation. In my work with partition refugees, and actually I've also been recently sent a WhatsApp message with a stand-up comedian who was joking about this. Everyone who left had a huge veranda, a lot of household help, and at least 20 extended family members living under one giant roof harmoniously. The wealth of that generation and the wealth that was lost by those families is legendary. They lost everything, partially because the date was dramatically moved up and people didn't know if they were going to be living in a new country. For many of the families I worked with on August 15th, they or their parents or grandparents woke up in a new country, but they had never left their ancestral homes. The decisions to leave were hasty and initially they thought temporary. Many recounted to me that they didn't realize that they would never go back. They were leaving due to safety they left their houses locked behind them. They buried their wealth in the grounds around the houses. They left behind utensils, kitchen goods, pretty much everything. The rational histories of migration can ignore all the messiness in the focus on a singular event, a single move without complication, keeping the lens on push-pull factors versus other ways of knowing and seeing but as I'm telling you, even with the refugees and their stories, many of them shared with me that they didn't realize that they were permanently moving when they actually left. I want to deepen our understanding of the complications of these layered mobilities for the emergence of the new regulatory regime of the Indian government towards its emigrant diaspora population. I've elsewhere explored those ideas about the emigrant state looking specifically at India. This paper that I'm sharing with you is a work in progress. I'd like to contribute to wider discussions on the complications of Asian mobility by advancing an argument to examine the intersections of territorialization, citizenship, sovereignty, nation, as seen through the lens of erstwhile categories of forced and voluntary Indian migrant mobility. What happens to our notions of migration if we tell the migration story from the perspective of the migrant family? My research is driven by a central focus on understanding a longish durée of South Asian migrant mobilities using the lens of family transmission of displacement. 
This paper shares glimpses into the silences surrounding migration and migration histories. Not everyone wants to speak of themselves in terms of a singular narrative of nation building. Or they do, and in order to do so, they need to erase their memories and what happened to their families. I've shared brief glimpses of that uh, migratory and traumatic grief. Those who were part of that larger displacement of families from what became West Pakistan. These men had to keep their families safe and ensure livelihoods. Partition, partition was a great equalizer. One of the stories that I heard repeated to the point of it almost being folklore is a story of a refugee who would sell flour. He bought a sack of flour for two rupees. He would sell the flour for two rupees. Then the gentleman would exclaim or ask me, what did he gain? What did the man gain? And I would say, I don't know, because that was very practiced of me. And they would happily say, the sack. He gained the two rupee sack. So the spendthriftness and cleverness of the refugee had reached this kind of legendary status in their stories, especially the entrepreneurial um, bent. So now, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, and Glenda, can I just check in with you about where we are in time? Because we started a little bit later. So I just want to make sure because I, I joined the screen earlier. So it's showing me over an hour. I'll go ahead and let that person in. <laughs> about how much time do I have left? 10 minutes? 15? Oops. Glenda, can you hear me? Yeah, I think. 15 or so, and then we'll have okay. questions. Okay, thank you, then I'll, then I'll keep going, thank you. Um, so now let me return to the beginning. Migration research is often driven by linear concerns of sending or receiving societies. My interest as an anthropologist has been to capture the voices of those who migrate, to allow for a spectral understanding of how migration memories complicate everyday life. What passes through the generations? How does history play out through families who've moved? In many ways, <coughs> the people I study are also living over generations through regimes of colonialism, socialism, capitalism, and late capitalism. I wanna share with you a story from Bangkok. In Bangkok, small Thanksgiving dinner party in 2020 when everything seemed fine in Bangkok with respect to COVID, my host shared <coughs> a prized possession hanging on the wall. It was his grandfather's picture from North Africa when he served in the Indian regiment. And a letter dated uh, 13th November, 1941. The words are from his diary found after his passing in 1997. Since marriage, our host and family has lived in New York, Delhi, and Bangkok. Growing up, he had lived in Buenos Aires, Argentina, Khartoum, Sudan, as his father was in the Foreign Service. In research on migrations in South Asia, and possibly all of Asia, I'm not convinced that we fully understand the ways that colonialism, including World War II, influenced processes of migration in the subsequent generations. We know the history, we understand movements to cities. In the case where you had British colonialism, we understand the move to cities because of uh, employments. I mean, to this day, Buckingham Palace is guarded by the Gurkha Regiment. So there's a lot of work on the histories of indenture following the end of slavery. And I, I would say that research in Africa has a better understanding of the rural urban movement cycles for work and the social and cultural consequences on tribal society as young men moved out. We're talking about research that was done at that time. But what I've come to realize is that the subsequent generations live in a state of permanent temporariness, not unlike the young man who's in his late 40s, early 50s, who showed me a picture of his grandfather serving in North Africa. He now lives in Singapore, where technically he's a voluntary talent migrant. When in Bangkok with family, he was a climate change migrant away from the pollution of India 
where he thought he had settled his young family for a long time. His father was part of the diplomatic corps. He himself was born and grew up in New York City, moved to South America as a child, then returned to New York City as a teenager and a university student and for his first job. And as I know from speaking with his wife, who has now become a good friend, before COVID, he traveled a lot. The point isn't the moves or the extreme travel. It's the willingness to move, willingness to move and travel because a part of that group of people who consider themselves nowhere people. And I have to tell you something. So I, uh, all of this text that I just read to you and the thing I sent to the family using WhatsApp, and I just said, is this okay if I can share this? And they're like, yeah, that's fine. You can share it. I just redact the name, which I've done. And um, his wife texts me back and said, uh, when I asked for the permission to use the family photo for the presentation, she said, everywhere people. They're not nowhere people, they're everywhere people. Hmm. They're not unique in this. Other studies have noted populations where people felt that, quote, migration was seen as being in our blood. Let's return to my initial interview with Mr. Sharma when he claimed to be from nowhere. His reluctance to give me a clear answer was frustrating. I wanted to probe if I wanted to probe into this fact, did he really feel like he was from nowhere? And was this something that was common amongst all the people who experienced the displacement of partition? Like, did they really believe they belonged nowhere? So then I said, well, what about your kids? <coughs> Are they from nowhere? He was firm and swift in his reply. They're from here. They don't know any place or any name in India isn't it? They don't want to remember. Sometimes we say, oh, you're that bua or you're that relation. They don't want to know. It's the practice of what you do. If you meet people, then you know them. If you don't meet them for a number of years, then you don't know them, referring to the relatives in India and the fact he hadn't taken his, his family back to visit them. That he also considered his children to be nowhere people who could claim the land that they lived on seemed less related to his own displacement, but rather his sense that they didn't know the kinship reference for his sister, Bua means uh, father, sister. <clears throat> he was clear that they saw themselves as being from England and that they had a sense of belonging in England. And perhaps that's how claiming to be from nowhere is effective. It allows one to claim wherever one is from, wherever one is currently living. This transnational generation are raised with these broken narratives that begin to unravel the ties between ethnicity, culture, and place, which led me to further question the larger connections between homeland and belonging, and the frames that we use to understand the links between transnationalism and migration. Well, what gives the British born generation a sense of being Punjabi? The memory of partition. And remember, this is not a coherent myth. Forms part of their Punjabi identity. This is true even for young Punjabis who were born in East Africa. For example, Karnal, ever reflective and always eloquent, migrated during the Amin ex uh, exodus from Uganda. His parents had migrated to East Africa and for were from the partition refugee families. So he says, quote, I think that, for example, the whole partition thing in a much way, in a, is in a way much more exacerbated. The partition experience is much more exacerbated in the Hindu Punjabis, wherever they are, respective of whether they actually had direct experience of partition. Because in a way, what it really touches upon is the very deepest sense of, well, who are you now? You know, before partition, one still had this ambivalence of what is our state? Who are we? Kind of flipping in several ways, in a way that was fine, that was comfortable, because there was no question then of a nationality. Part of the modern disease is that unfortunately, nationality is primary. And in this, Hindu Punjabis find themselves in a very peculiar problem. 
Karnal's words reveal that partition is about being connected to issues of homeland, belonging, longing, and being part of that larger diaspora. The historical movement of the formation of the Punjab ruptured the narratives of place and identity. And the people I work with revealed the many entanglements of shifting Punjabi identity because of partition. The sense of displacement and belonging nowhere is not new. As my informant Karnal at a different time claimed, Hindu Punjabis were always nomads. Quote, I think this is the most interesting thing that we were all really a true migrant community and we have been for generations, way before we ever arrived here. We have been migrating from ourselves. <clears throat> I've just started to read John Irving's Son of the Circus, which has a similar sort of sense because I'm a foreigner overseas, of course, and I'm a stranger at home. John Irving has got this character who feels a foreigner in Toronto and a foreigner in Bombay where he was born and that the essential nature of the Indian in this book is to be the foreigner wherever. But I think this is the essential nature of the Hindu Punjabis. This quotation stresses the dislocation of the Hindu Punjabi experience from India. The experience with displacement in one generation and migration in the next has cast these people, these Hindu Punjabis as a diasporic population and as nomads with no clear belonging to the Indian nation. For people like Karnal, there's an added complication of the migration to Africa. Thus they narrate another displacement, one in which they mark their departure from East Africa to England. I don't even have time to go into the whole Amin crisis, but briefly in the seventies, um, I guess the nicest way to put it is Asians were asked to leave as, um, uh, Africa became more for Black Africans. These twice and three times migrants have claimed multiple homelands because of what their families have experienced. For this generation then, it is not only about a connection to a homeland, but which homeland they could claim. Some of them have taken to referring to themselves as being a foreigner wherever, or nomads as Karnal, <clears throat> Carnell said to me later, I know where I'm going to die. It's here. If for some reason that means this is my country, well, so be it. If you all ask me, all I can say is, this is where I'm going to die. That's it. I'm different things in different places, but the only thing I have, which I think is consistent, is being a nomad, of being a foreigner everywhere. And with these words, he returns us to that notion of nowhere and everywhere people. What I've shared this afternoon are the stories of the professional middle class under the radar at best, and definitely a less studied group of migrants, possibly because they're not illegal, they work in professions, they don't trigger large funding cycles to try to gain clues into what went wrong with some aspect of assimilation or immigration. They're educated, they work hard, they're successful in what they do. They move for jobs, for education, for a better life, and are accepted on paper at least. But they do not necessarily look for belonging in every space they go to. This doesn't mean they don't feel it or that they don't connect to the places they live. The familiarity of certain spaces is comforting and the deep connections that they have are beyond the boundaries of the nation state. The family, perhaps because of this level of hypermobility, becomes the key fundamental, meaningful unit of social structure. This is such an old fashioned social science way to parse the world, I know. But what I've observed in many countries is that these families are, be, are very good at being involved in lives thousands of miles away, while also good at keeping a distance from the nitty gritty of the everyday family life. When they meet, they pick up where they left off, even if some time has passed in between. Not to mention that the rational actor view of migration, which continues to dominate, is really, quote, a methodological individualism inherent in rational choice theory and utility maximization, which underlies many theories of migration. That's from Ian Bakewell's article. <laughs> the quote from Bakewell, goes on to argue for a critical realism approach, which, quote, 
must take account of the structural forces promoting emigration in areas of origin and enabling immigration in destinations, the motivations, goals, aspirations of the people who migrate, the social and economic structures that connect areas of inward and outward migration. These can be mapped onto morphogenic cycles of structural conditions, structural forces shaping emigration and immigration, social interactions of those who migrate, and structural elaboration, ev evolution of networks and migration systems. The puzzle for research is to unpack that cycle, to understand both its elements and the casual mechanisms that drive it." End quote. The concept and focus on voluntary and involuntary migrations is an interesting way around an old problem in migration theory. What's the relationship between agency and structure when people move? Voluntary migration conceptualizes a hyperactive agency approach whereby involuntary migration focuses and expands on the structural limits that cause migrations and generally assumes that agency is not present as they are not choosing to leave. If we look at the ways that people decide to move, there's a spectrum and their decisions are entirely based on their families, supporting them, educating them, ensuring better futures for their kids. In this understanding, there's more of a spectrum between these two poles and a link between them. But the people I studied, they were refugees in one generation, voluntary brain drain migrants in the next, and hypermobile in the third and fourth generation since partition. In what ways does memory of that displacement or previous movements, as in the army, serve as a catalyst to future moves in future generations? More recently, I've been thinking about migratory grief and traumatic displacement, how it transfers through the generations. The picture that I kept up for the whole time here is one of those examples that I would have where people just embrace that displacement and they sort of claim it and it becomes part of their own family's ways of telling themselves stories about themselves. Uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So now we're sitting at this year. It's the 75th anniversary. And like every year, <coughs> the, the event is overshadowed by the celebration of independence and the birth of both nations. Partition is part of the public sphere, but is not the focus of the narrative national jubilations. To take into account deliberate forgetting by the nation state the dying memories from those who experienced the displacements firsthand, who don't speak about it, don't really want to speak about it, is more of an interpretation of the past to suit the present. <clears throat> what I find really surprising is how now you have lots of different interests in partition. And those complications of the past and those migrations are being put into service for more modern sensibilities. And here I'm thinking about uh, new partition museums that have come up, a partition archive, and a, uh, which is a website that's trying to get 10,000 stories of displacement, a fraction of the refugees, um, actually who they're interviewing would have been child migrants, art installations, and a proliferation of nonfiction books written by the grandchildren of the refugee generation, not academics or historians, but those who recognize that there are silences and their own curiosity, and it went and followed it and interviewed and documented what they could through their own families or through wider networks. The nowhere people are reaching out. They're trying to find each other in the isolation and they realize through their words and works, through interviews, through archival research and family histories, through poems that they can find each other. So let me end now, and you can just go to that next slide, please. These are the questions that I'm ending with, and I'm not going to read all of them out to you. But most of the work, you know, is in light of either structuration theories, impacting migration or agency, actor-driven accounts. Given that my participants were more than willing to recite the official history and forego their own personal histories, 
made it less likely for me that these stories would actually be recorded or written down. In this, their agency is based on their instinct for survival. If the places they left behind were not open to them and the borders and citizenship rules took 10 years to become more real, others are reuniting with families on either side of the border. So you see the newspaper accounts of people after 70 years are finding brothers and sisters on either side. Their initial insistence on the official record completely blows up for me this discussion of structure and agency. In this case, they had become one in the same narrative. And yet, based on the voices from my fieldwork in London, Delhi, interviews in Singapore, Bangkok, Washington DC and Dubai, the erasure of the intricacies of family migration histories will be the biggest casualty of this way of thinking about migration in terms of push and pull agents and structures. So these are some of my thoughts right now, and I'm, I'm hoping to develop them further and hopefully find a good home for these ideas. I really look forward to our discussion and I'm happy to clarify any thoughts. I do apologize for my coughing. Um, and I was hoping some of this might, you know, resonate with some of the work that others are doing and we could have a fruitful discussion during our remaining time on the Zoom. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Thank you so much, Dalika. Thank you. You can stop sharing the screen now, please. Thank you. Thanks for all your help. So um, I have just uh, put in the chat, for those of you who have questions or comments, you are welcome to raise your hands here because uh, we are rather a relatively manageable crowd. Or you can um, also uh, type in the chat for if you feel more comfortable <laughs> formulating your questions in 